ولا تعجل بالقرآن من قبل أن يقضى إليك وحيه وقل رب زدني علما إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Today then will be the first class moving into the text of the three fundamental principles. Previously we mentioned that this book is based upon the three questions that every person will be asked in their grave. The fitnatul qadr, the trial of the grave. Who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who is your prophet? Those three questions are key questions. They are the basics of this religion. Knowing who your Lord is, knowing what your religion is, and knowing who your prophet is. So that is what we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks, insha'Allah ta'ala, one by one. Initially, the section regarding who is your Lord, understanding who Allah is, then the section regarding what is your religion, understanding the basic details of Islam, and then at the end, the section regarding who is your prophet, understanding who the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. So in this particular book that we're using to do that, the book that is known as The Three Fundamental Principles, Thalathatul Usul. This particular book written by a scholar of Islam by the name of Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, wrote this book. When exactly? How many years are we talking about? Roughly 200 years or so, you could say. It is not a book written by a scholar of our time right now. It was a couple of hundred years ago when a Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala lived and when he wrote this particular book. The book, in fact, he wrote it in three versions. There are three versions of this book. One version is the version that he wrote for the students of knowledge. In the normal Fusha Arabic. Then there was a version that he wrote for the commoners. Those who may not be educated in the language they may not have a detailed understanding of Fusha, so he wrote one version for them in what you may call slang Arabic. So that even the uneducated could read that and understand it. They could understand the questions and the answers to these three basic principles. Then there is another version you could say that is written for children, simplified and easy. And the reason why a Sheikh Muhammad rahimahullah ta'ala did that is in order to broaden the benefit to all people in the community, in the society. It wasn't only aimed at the students of knowledge, wasn't only aimed at the highly educated, it was aimed at all of the people. Those who were not educated, then there was a version written in the dialect 
written in what you may call slang in order that they could then also understand even if they weren't educated because these are simple basic aspects of our religion that we must all understand every Muslim should understand and know the answers to these questions who is your Lord who is Allah what is your religion and who is your prophet that is what you are going to be questioned about when we die that is what we have been told by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that when you die in your grave the two angels they come to you they sit you up and they ask you those three questions man rabbuka wa ma dinuka wa man nabiyuka who is your lord what is your religion and who is your prophet so if we begin then with the actual text of this book and remember those workbooks are available if you haven't already got one for today speak to them at the office and inshallah have a copy ready by next week so you can follow along easier you can even read ahead for the next week before we get to it so you have some background as to what is going to be covered and you can revise easily the previous lessons because it's all there structured in the workbook on top of the workbook for those who do have copies of the explanation of a shaykh al-fawzan hafizahullah ta'ala then i advise you to get a copy of that if you speak arabic get the arabic version if not then i believe it's available in english so get the english version of the explanation of a shaykh al-fawzan hafizahullah ta'ala some may already have the copy of a shaykh al-uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala that's all good too bring those copies with you to the class read the sections that we're going to be covering and that will all help you in understanding and grasping these lessons properly so at the beginning then he says bismillah بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم and that means in the name of Allah the most beneficent the most merciful as they often mention in the English the point of this is what what does it actually mean بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم this is something which is mentioned at the beginning of books. You notice the scholars always begin with the basmala in the beginning of lectures, in the beginning of talks. At the beginnings, you always see this being mentioned that you begin in the name of Allah. Bismillah. But what is the point behind that? Why do you begin in the name of Allah when you're going to start writing a book or you're going to deliver a lecture? Why begin with Bismillah? What is the meaning of that? Hands up if you know. Go on. Because it means that you are seeking aid and assistance, correct? That you are seeking assistance from Allah in what you're about to do it means astainu billah that you are seeking aid and assistance from allah in what you're about to do so it mentions here ibtada'a al-musannifu rahimahullah kitabahu bil basmala iqtida'an bil kitab al-aziz wa ta'assiyan بالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في مكاتباته ومراسلاته. The author began by saying in the name of Allah, Bismillah, and that is in line with 
following on from how the Qur'an is. When you look at the Qur'an, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the chapters at the beginning of them you have, Bismillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, similarly, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to write letters, when he used to uh, be with that, uh, in that correspondence with other rulers and other leaders and inviting them to Islam, etc. When he was corresponding with people in that way, his letters, his messages, he would begin them with, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. He would begin with the Basmalah. So it is in line with what we find in the Qur'an and what we find from the practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to begin your affairs, your activities, what you're going to do in the name of Allah. Because by doing so, you are seeking aid and assistance from Allah in your affairs and what you are doing is relevant to it. So if you're about to start writing a book and you begin with Bismillah, then it's as though you are saying, in the name of Allah, I ask Allah to aid me in the writing of this book. And you're going to give a lecture and you start with Bismillah, then it is as though you are saying, I begin in the name of Allah, seeking assistance from Allah to deliver this lecture. You are seeking assistance from Allah in your affairs. And we, the creation of Allah, the small creation, we are in need of the assistance of our Lord constantly. We cannot do without the assistance of our Lord that the mercy of Allah, without the help of Allah at all, we cannot do without that at all. We are always in need of the aid and the assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What would this creation do without their Lord? This creation is nothing without its creator. All of that which Allah created in this world, you look around you from the huge mountains that exist, from the vast oceans that exist, from all of the animals, the tiny insects to the large animals. Everything in this world, you look at this creation, you look at the sun and its magnificence, the moon and its magnificence, you see all of that and you recognize you are nothing but a tiny speck a small creation from this vast creation of Allah. And you are a tiny creation who therefore is in constant need of the aid and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he began his book with the basmala. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Those are two of the names of Allah. Because as we know, Allah has many names. Allah has many names. And we do not know exactly how many names Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. But these are two examples. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And they are names that indicate the attribute of mercy, that Allah is the merciful, the all merciful, who has mercy upon his creation. And in everything around you, you see that mercy of Allah. The fact that you can breathe and you can eat and you can drink and you have air to breathe and clothes to wear and homes to live in. And all of that from the mercy of Allah upon you. 
So he began his book with that statement. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And many of the books of the scholars that you read, you will see that they begin with that statement. Then he says, اعلم رحمك الله أنه يجب علينا تعلم أربع مسائل. He says, no, have knowledge. May Allah have mercy upon you. That it is obligatory upon us to have knowledge about four issues. It is obligatory upon us to have knowledge of four affairs. Look at how he phrases the opening line to us. I'lam, have knowledge, rahimak Allah. May Allah have mercy upon you. Why would he need to add that line in there? That have knowledge, no, may Allah have mercy upon you. He is mentioning that there in order to indicate and show that he sincerely wants the people to understand and comprehend that he is genuine in writing this book, wanting to benefit the people. He is supplicating for us, making dua for us, asking Allah to have mercy upon us. I'lam rahimak Allah. No, may Allah have mercy upon you. And this, as the scholars mention, indicates the sincerity of a Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, indicates the sincerity of the Sheikh, that he makes dua for the readers, makes dua for the listeners, genuinely wants everybody to learn and to understand and to benefit. So he says, I'lam rahimak Allah, have knowledge, May Allah have mercy upon you. أَنَّهُ يَجِبُ عَلَيْنَا تَعَلُّمُ أَرْبَعِ مَسَائِلِ That it is obligatory upon us to have knowledge of four affairs. These opening four topics are topics that every Muslim should know about. Four basic affairs Four basic issues that all of us, every Muslim, should have knowledge of and understanding of. <coughs> so he says that there are four affairs that all of us need to have knowledge of. Male or female, whatever your race, whatever your wealth, Regardless of any of those factors, every Muslim needs to have knowledge of these four affairs. So what is the first one that he mentions then? Al-Ula, Al-Ilm. The first is knowledge of what though? Wa huwa ma'rifatullah. وَمَعْرِفَةُ نَبِيِّهِ وَمَعْرِفَةُ دِينِ الْإِسْلَامِ بِالْأَدِلَّةِ To have knowledge of Allah and His Prophet and the religion of Islam with the evidences. That's the first point he is making. That all of us as Muslims should have knowledge of who our Lord is, should have knowledge of who our Prophet is, and should have knowledge of what our religion is, and the details and evidences of that. That's a very important point to remember from now, from the basis, the point about evidences. 
Now when you look around at the Muslims, many different factions of Muslims across the world, and they may have slightly different opinions about how to practice Islam. Some of them preaching one particular way, others preaching another particular methodology, others preaching another ideology. There are differences amongst them, you see. So how are we going to work out where the truth is? How are we going to work out which practice of Islam is the real, true practice of Islam? That is going to be established and worked out from the evidences and proofs in the religion, not from emotions and intellects of people. Many people out there, they make their judgments and their rulings and decide what to do and how to do it based upon emotions or based upon their intellects and their own comprehension. That is not how our religion is based upon or what it is based upon. Our religion of Islam, every Muslim should know, is based upon evidences. If somebody tells you as a Muslim you have to pray five times a day, then you need to have evidence to prove that from the revelation that came from Allah and from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And do we have that? Absolutely the evidences are there that you have to pray five times a day. For example, any other act of worship, take this as a simple rule. Anybody ever says to you as a Muslim, you have to do X, Y, or Z. The simplest thing to say is, where is the evidence? Where is the proof that as a Muslim, I have to do X, Y, or Z? They tell you as a Muslim, you have to perform Hajj once in your lifetime if you have the means and ability. You say, where is the proof for that? Then they must provide the proof. And is there proof? Absolutely. There is a narration from the Prophet Muhammad, a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he told us about doing the Hajj, going to Mecca and performing that Hajj once in the lifetime if you have the ability and the wealth to do so. So any act of worship, it must be proven. If you cannot prove it, you cannot show me anywhere in the Quran where it says you have to do that. You cannot show me anywhere in the Sunnah. The Sunnah, meaning the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where it says you have to do that, then you are not obliged to do it. Or along with those two, the practice and the sunnah, the tradition of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If somebody cannot bring you proof from those sources, then you are not obliged to follow what they say. Take that as a simple rule, because otherwise people will come to you with anything and everything. They will say as a Muslim, you have to do this. And as a Muslim, you have to do that. And you have to celebrate this and you have to all types of things. Have they got proof and evidence from the Quran, from the Sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet, from the companions? The students who were with the Prophet and learned from the Prophet, have they got any evidences from anywhere there? If they do not, then you are not obliged to follow that until they can bring you some proof. If you stick by that rule, then it will save you from many of the calamities. It will save you from many of the misguidances. Look at what some of the people do in the name of Islam. 
how they go and commit, for example, terrorism acts, extremism acts, and they do that proclaiming the name of Islam, saying that it is in the name of Islam. Is it in the name of Islam? Absolutely not. Because if you apply the rule to them and ask them, well, where in Islam does it tell you that you have to go and do these acts that you're claiming? Where in the Quran? Where in the teachings of the Prophet? Where in the teachings of the companions of the Prophet? Where did they ever say go and do this blowing and bombing and all these things? They will never be able to show you evidences. Rather, the evidences will show you the opposite. Others, they come along with other deviated beliefs. But this is the point. Take that as a rule and you'll know that whatever you're doing then is the correct thing to be doing. That you ask the person to show you the evidence from the Quran, the speech of Allah, the guidance from Allah, the book of Allah. Well, you ask them to show you from the Sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad or from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad So that's why he says here, you have to have knowledge of Allah, knowledge of the, of the Prophet, and knowledge of the religion with the evidences. Not just what any Tom, Dick and Harry comes along and tells you. Not what anybody just makes up. You have to do this, you have to do that. But your religion is upon evidences. The one who doesn't have any evidence, then you're not obliged to follow his intellect or his own thoughts about things. There is a hadith or a narration from Ali. Ali radiallahu anhu, who was one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He mentioned in one narration, لَوْ كَانَ الدِّينُ بِالرَّأِي If this religion was based upon intellect, that everybody can just use their own brain and work out what they think is okay and not, if that's what this religion was, لَكَانَ الْمَسْحُ عَلَى بَاطِنِ الْخُفْ أَوْلَى مِنْ ظَاهِرِهِ that wiping over the bottom of the socks would have been more intelligible to you than wiping over the top. You know, when you make the purification for prayer, if you've already purified before and then put your socks on, the next time you make your purification for prayer, you don't have to take your socks off and wash your feet again. You can wipe over the top of your socks with some wet hands and that is sufficient. Where do you wipe them? Logically, your mind would tell you to wipe the bottom side of the socks because that's where you've been walking and that's where the dust has picked up and collected. But the religion tells us, the sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet tells us that you wipe over the top. That's not typically where the dust and the dirt collects, but that's what the teachings of the religion tell us to do. So that is what you do. If you were using your intellect, you would have said, wipe the bottom side. That's the dirty side, clean that. But the religion is not about your intelligence and your intellect. If we open that up, then everybody will have their own opinions about what Islam is and what we should do and what we should not do. That isn't what religion is. This religion was revealed to us from Allah, the Creator, our Lord, taught to us then by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Revelation it was, revelation it is, just like the previous revelations before that, the revelation that came to Moses, the revelation that came to Abraham, revelation that came to Jesus, they were all revelations from Allah. And then the final revelation came, the one that is the ultimate revelation in the end, and that was the revelation of the Quran and the Sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet. And that is the final revelation 
that mankind is now obliged to follow. Because all of those revelations came from Allah, from our Lord, from our Creator. The Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms of David, all of those things, they all came from revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Revelation to the prophets and messengers in history that went by. Then Allah again Himself sent the final revelation to us. And that final revelation then is the last one that mankind, the jinn and the humans are now obliged to follow. You cannot now say, I'm going to stick with one of the older revelations. You cannot now say, I'm going to stay with the revelation that came to Moses, or I'm going to stay with the revelation that came to Jesus. You cannot stay with the older revelations if Allah, our Creator, our Lord, has then sent later revelations, the ones at the end, after those original ones. It's the latest one, the last one, the Quran and the Sunnah that we must now follow. You cannot neglect that and say you're going to stay with the older ones. Hence, Allah said in the Quran, Inna deena inda Allah islam Indeed, the religion with Allah is al-Islam. وَمَنْ يَرْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينَا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ Whomsoever seeks a religion other than Islam, then it will not be accepted from him. This is the final revelation that Allah has sent to this earth. And this is the one that we are now obliged to follow. So remember the point that we were making here. The author said, it is obligatory upon the Muslims to have knowledge of four things. The first thing, the first point is to have knowledge of who your Lord is, what your religion is, and who your prophet is, which is what the book is going to elaborate upon later. Knowledge, when we talk about knowledge in the religion, obviously all of us have different levels of knowledge. Some of us have more knowledge about the religion than others. Some of us may be new, we haven't been coming before. We have less knowledge than others who've been coming for many years. Some of us may be new to Islam even. We're all different levels, all at different stages of knowledge. So then the question that arises is, what is the level of knowledge, the disparity in that knowledge, what amount do I have to have? What is the amount of knowledge that every Muslim needs to have even though there will be differences in the levels that everybody has? There has to be a minimum quantity that all of us have to have. There has to be a minimum quantity that all of us have to have. The minimum quantity that all of us have to have is the amount of knowledge that we need by necessity to be able to worship Allah. Allah created you for what purpose? To worship Him. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah told us in the Quran that He created Mankind and jinn for us to worship him. I did not create the jinn or humans except for them to worship me. Allah created us to worship him. <coughs> so if that is the reason why Allah created us, and that is our objective here in life, to worship him, then we need to know how to worship Him. Because how else are you going to fulfill your objective in creation of worshipping Allah if you don't know how to worship Allah? 
So the minimum quantity of knowledge you need to have about your religion is that quantity which enables you to be able to worship Allah accordingly. So now, for example, we know that the basic principle of our religion is Tawheed, monotheism. That we worship our Creator, our Lord, Allah alone. We do not associate any partners to Him. If you associate any type of partners to Allah, then that is the greatest sin. Associating partners to Allah. Shirk. So what is a minimum quantity of knowledge we're all going to have to learn? What Tawheed is, what monotheism is, and what shirk is. We all have to know that. Otherwise you may end up doing something which is shirk, which is associating partners to Allah. And that is the greatest sin. The sin that would lead you to hellfire, to make partners alongside our Lord, to assume uh, aids and help us to Allah, or to say that Allah has partners or sons or wives or children, to make any type of equal or partner or helper to Allah. And that is a great sin, the greatest of sins. Therefore, all Muslims need to focus on understanding what monotheism is, what tawheed is, and what shirk is, to make sure that you never fall into that shirk. We know that Islamically we have to pray five times a day. Therefore, a minimum quantity of knowledge all of us are going to have to have is to know how to pray. Because if you don't know how to pray, then how are you going to fulfill the obligation upon you of praying five times a day? Like I said, we're all at different levels of knowledge. Some of us may be just beginning, no problem. You begin and you start and you go step by step until you learn it. You learn it step by step. Doesn't matter if you're at the beginning yet. Doesn't matter if you're at the first stage yet. Doesn't matter if you've never learned before. Now is the opportunity you begin. You begin and you start learning. There was a man or there is a man. One of our uncles, an Albanian. Perhaps in his 60s or 70s, Allah Alam. 60s or 70s. And he just started <laughs> learning how to read the Quran. Alif, Ba, Ta. Just started learning how to read properly for the first time. Any problem in that? 60, 70 years old? No problem. Start. You haven't done it before? Do it now. Now that Allah has guided you to the truth, has guided you and blessed you with this understanding that you need to be practicing Islam, that this is the way to salvation, then begin step by step. And those small steps, they build up until within a year or two years or three years, then perhaps you are more knowledgeable than the vast majority of those around you. Perhaps in a year, you have learned all of the prayer, you've learned all of the various other parts of the religion, step by step you begin. It's a long journey, but any long journey can only be finished if you start. You must start that journey and start those steps and start moving. And even if it takes time, it takes more steps, it takes many steps, but every step you're taking, you're moving along in that journey of learning. So that knowledge, the minimum quantity, that all of us have to have is the quantity that enables us to worship Allah. If you don't have that, then it's a big problem. If you don't know how to worship Allah, you don't know what monotheism is, what tawheed is, you don't know what shirk is, you don't know how to make wudu, the ablution, the purification before you pray, or you don't know how to pray itself, you don't know those things, then how are you going to worship Allah? How are you going to fulfill the obligations to Allah? That's why the scholars, they mention as well, that there are two types of knowledge. 
There is the knowledge that is fardu ayn. And there is the knowledge that is fardu kifayah. The fardu ayn, what that means is that it is a type of knowledge that every single Muslim must know. And that is the types of things we've been talking about now, the minimum quantity of knowledge. Then there is fard kifai, or kifaya. And that is the knowledge that as long as some of the Muslims have that knowledge, it suffices the remainder. It is not an obligation upon every single person. You could maybe mention some of the detailed affairs like mustalahat, the sciences of hadith. We've been talking about the sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. How do we verify that a particular teaching is definitely from the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ? Somebody could come and just make up something and say that is a teaching of the Prophet. How are we going to weed things out? How are we going to work out which ones are actually genuinely teachings of the Prophet and which ones are made up or they're lies or they're not authentic? That is known as the sciences of hadith. That is not something everybody will know how to do. Only those who are more knowledgeable scholars, students of knowledge, who delve into that science and into that field of studying, will get to that level of being able to work out those things. So that isn't an obligation on everybody. That is, a, that is something certain Muslims will do. So there are certain types of knowledge that will be high level knowledge that isn't obligatory upon everyone. That is upon some to do. But the lower level basic minimum quantity that is obligatory on all of us we all have to know what monotheism is what tawheed is we all have to know about our belief in allah belief in the angels belief in the prophets and messengers belief in the revelations and books that allah sent belief in the day of judgment belief in the decree we all have to have basic knowledge of those types of things that is a minimum quantity of knowledge. Then, and that is what Al Imam Ahmed in fact said. يجب أن يطلب من العلم ما يقوم به دينا. It is obligatory upon a person to seek knowledge to the extent, the amount that is necessitated for him to keep his religion upright. For you to be able to worship Allah properly, you need a minimum level of knowledge. That is something all of us must have. It is also mentioned, اعلم رحمك الله أن طلب العلم فريضة وأنه شفاء للقلوب المريضة Seeking knowledge is a cure for the diseased hearts. It is a cure for the diseased hearts. If you find your heart is empty and void, you find your heart, there's something missing in it, there's a hole in it. There was something in your life that you're not understanding. There was a vacancy, a vacuum in your heart that is filled with knowledge. When you start learning who your Lord is in reality, and you start learning what your religion is, you start learning who the Prophet Muhammad is, you start learning of the reward that Allah has prepared for the believers in paradise, and you learn about the evil recompense of the wrongdoers in hellfire, the more you learn about all of these things, the stronger your Iman becomes, the stronger your Iman, your faith becomes, and the more you find that the vacancy, the vacuum in your heart decreases and disappears, and you find a goal and objective and fulfillment in your life that you did not have before you learned this knowledge. So then after that he mentions, وَهُوَ مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ 
ومعرفة نبيه ومعرفة دين الإسلام بالأدلة Very is to have knowledge of Allah, our Lord, our Creator, and also knowledge of His Prophet. Somebody may say, why is it important to know about the Prophet Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why is it important to know about him? Isn't it enough to know about Allah, our Creator, where the revelation came from? Why is there such a need to know about the Prophet? who taught us the revelation. The revelation isn't from the Prophet, the revelation is from Allah. So isn't it enough to just learn about Allah and the revelation? Why do we have to spend time learning about the Prophet too? That is because as the scholars have mentioned, the Prophets and Messengers who came throughout history, from the very beginning, the first man, Adam, and then after that, all of the prophets and messengers that came, Nuh, Noah, and Musa, Moses, and Abraham, Ibrahim, and Isa, Jesus, and the <coughs> final messenger, Muhammad, وسلم, all of them, they were the ones who conveyed the revelation from Allah to us. When the revelation came from Allah, when the revelation came from our Creator, did it come to us all individually? Did it come to every person one by one? Did the angel Gabriel, Jibril, come to every person one by one, teaching him that revelation from our Lord? He did not. The angel Gabriel, Jibril, the trustworthy, was sent only to the prophets and messengers with the revelation from Allah. They then taught and conveyed it to the people. So the link between Allah and the revelation and us is via the prophets and messengers. The prophets and messengers are that link through which the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to us. It didn't come to us directly. It came to us via those prophets and messengers. That is why it's important to know who these prophets and messengers were. That's why in the Quran, there are so many chapters that tell us about the prophets and messengers. So many parts in the Quran that talk about the story of Moses. They talk about the story of when he was young and he was a baby and the Pharaoh was killing all the baby boys and then his mother put, the, put Moses, Musa into the basket. All of that story tells us about the story of Jesus, the story of Mary, the story of Noah and the ark. All of those stories were in the Quran because it's important for us to know who the prophets and messengers were because they were the link that conveyed the message of Allah to mankind, to the jinn of mankind, as in the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why it's important that one chapter at the end is going to focus on learning about who the Prophet Muhammad actually was. And also, as he says there, knowing about the religion of Islam with the evidences and that we've already touched upon, explaining how when you learn about Islam, you have to learn it with the proofs and the evidences. And as we go through teaching these basic points about Islam in this course, over the next few weeks now, every point we make, we are going to show the evidence from the Quran or from the Sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. None of it is going to be what somebody has made up, what I've made up, what anybody else has made up. That is not what our religion is about. Religion is pure and clean. It is revelation from Allah. So everything we mention, it is always going to have evidences to prove what is being said. And in that way, you'll know for definite that you're learning the proper Islam, not the Islam that people make up or the Islam that you see on the media 
and the Islam that you hear about and read about on the internet, anybody can say anything they want on public media and social media. That isn't what religion is. Religion, learning it properly, is from the revelation that Allah sent us, from the Quran and from the Sunnah. So that is where we're going to round off on today. On that point, and inshallah ta'ala, from next week we'll carry on with the next section of the book. Uh, from the second point, remember here, he had said that there are four points you have to know. We've only just touched upon the first point there. That you have to have knowledge of Allah, the religion and the messenger. Next week we'll do point two, three and four. Any questions now you can do those for a while? Yeah, last week you mentioned that we believe in the great. The believers will be able to answer the questions. And it is believed that they won't be able to answer the questions. When it's said that the believers will be able to answer the questions, that include even the most simple of the believers, for example, and they, those that live in the and they die just on that. Believers in the grave, in the barzakh, when they are asked these questions, they will be able to answer. So, a sinner, a wrongdoer, compared to a kafir, there's a big difference still. A kafir, it's mentioned how they are unable. The believers, those Allah said, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ That Allah will make firm with an upright statement those who have iman. Those who have Iman, and with Iman always comes action. Those upon Iman and action, then Allah will make them firm and upright in being able to answer the questions of the angels. Those who are sinners and wrongdoers, then as the scholars say, it is feared upon you what your state is going to be at death and barzakh and afterlife. It is feared upon the wrongdoer and the sinner. So certainly what a person needs to strive with is knowledge and action, increasing your faith, your iman. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Scott, a question. Uh, if you have a, an imam or a brother leading the prayer in a Salafi mosque, well-known Salafi, and he goes to a different mosque where they bring in different people to in the prayer in the mosque, uh, and he needs a prayer, like for example, most, some salah, for example, fajr or whatever. The question is, I advised him, he said there's nobody there, but there's like an imam who leads a prayer in Taraweeh in the morning. So the question is, can he continue leading a prayer there in fajr, or can he supposed to leave because it's an example to the salah? And there is a person there who leads the prayer in Taraweeh. Who leads a person, who leads a prayer in Jum'ah, sorry, who's the imam of the Misir of Jum'ah, yes. So, so question, there's somebody who can lead the prayer. So the question, can he lead the prayer there if he's not, they're inviting different people? No, but you're saying in a situation that there is a Salafi going to a masjid and he leads the prayer, but is that because there is nobody else to lead the prayer or is there somebody else capable of leading the prayer? The, the, he said there's nobody there, but I've, I've seen somebody as an imam leading the prayer. I mean, who does that? So you've seen somebody who can lead the prayer? Yes. In, in the, and in that case, there isn't any need. In that case, why is there need? If you go to a mosque and they're inviting all types of people, and like we've just been talking about, they're not sticking clearly to the evidences in what they say. That type of place, why do you need to get involved if they have got people who can do it? If you are in a situation where they haven't, Imagine you go now and nobody else can lead the prayer. All of them may be clean shaven, all of them this, or no, nobody can recite the Quran. Then lead the prayer. You're not going to say, no, you lead the prayer clean shaven, nothing can't recite. Lead the prayer then. But in the circumstance where there are others there, they can do it, they can lead. You don't need to get yourself involved and then uh, put yourself into that position. You don't need to do that when others can do that. Only in the situation where nothing is available, you look around, you are the one. Then you have to do it, do it. But otherwise, no. Anything else? One each before we come to two. Anybody else? <laughs> Any other questions? Also, in these classes, at the end, we'll try and have a small time when we can do questions, inshallah. If sisters also want to send questions in future, 
from next week, the week after, in future, they can write them on pieces of paper and they can send them. Or if they have brothers here from the Maharam, they can text them through the questions. So we can try and take the questions from the sisters also, inshallah ta'ala. But we'll round off on that for today then. Next week, straight after Asr, we'll continue inshallah ta'ala. Next week for today.